first of all, thank you very much for the very warm welcome. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, some of you may know that I actually am a Hoya. Um, I have my undergraduate degree from Georgetown, so it's a pleasure to finally come to this campus after having spent time on the Washington campus so many years ago. Uh, my talk this evening, as the title suggests, draws from the uh, book which Mehran was kind enough to promote. Um, and uh, it is called Official Stories, uh, The Politics of National Narratives in Egypt and Algeria. For uh, that project was one in which I tried to explore how leaderships or ruling elites construct a national story or a national narrative for political purposes. And in thinking about the relationship between elites, national leaderships, and these um, narratives, my attention was drawn to two sets of interrelated issues. One is the uses to which a narrative can be put as part of an ongoing process of state consolidation or regime maintenance. That is the legitimizing role that it may play. And the second then is the sources or the possible junctures for introducing change into a narrative. In other words, narratives are not stable. They're constantly evolving entities. So how and why do they change? Now, in the larger project, I worked on three case countries, Algeria, Egypt, and Jordan, although as the title of the book suggests, the Jordan case didn't make it into the final volume. It was too long. Um, I looked at over a 70-year period, uh, or about a 70-year period for all three countries, beginning just prior um, to independence. But today, uh, I'll spare you, I'm going to speak only about Egypt, and I'm going to speak about only one thread in the narrative, the national narrative of Egypt, and that is that which relates to the concept of revolution. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, which is the founding story in the case of Egypt. Now that might have seemed to have perhaps only academic interest um, up until about 2011, but developments since January of 2011 I think make clear that trying to understand what we mean by revolution, how the notion of revolution evolves, is an ongoing important political, um, it, it's important politically, it's for, important for us in trying to understand uh, contests, political struggles on the ground. All right, so the, the, the evolution of the concept continues. So before turning specifically to the Egyptian case, let me explain kind of what I want to do during the course of the, the talk. One is to show how the meaning of the term revolution was constructed and reconstructed over time in Egypt, and I'll focus on a number of what I'll call key junctures or crises. Um, how that content then, this is the second thing, how that content relates to the need to build or rebuild legitimacy for a leadership or a regime. And then third, what types of crises or challenges are most likely to trigger attempts at reconstructing or reinterpreting what's meant by revolution as part of a national narrative. Okay. So first let me say what I mean by a national narrative um, and how I'm, uh, how I'm using it. That's good change over to Egypt since that's my case, so you can look at the pictures of these fine gentlemen here. All right. Um, one author, Yadgar, defines a national narrative as the, uh, the story that a national collective tells about itself. It tells individuals who constitute the nation and anybody else who's interested, who they are, what comprises their past, that is the national common past, um, and what the structure of their characteristics as a collective is and what they are, are and where they're heading as a people. All right. Now, these uh, national narratives generally include a set of identifiable heroes, past and present, perhaps individuals or collectives. They may be real or mythical. In order to establish a group's distinct identity vis-a-vis -vis other groups, uh, the narrative will generally highlight particular events or an event that, will, that marks the emergence of that national collective. <laughs> Where possible, this narrative may reach into the very distant past and try to, in effect, assert claim to the glory of a past civilization which, took, which uh, existed on what has become the territory of the nation state. And then finally, it'll specify a set of characteristics or traits. They could be cultural, they could be linguistics, they may be ethnic, religious, confessional, which are all understood to be constitutive of a people's identity. Now, national narratives are generated at different levels. They can be generated at a popular level. They can be generated at a state level. My interest was in trying to understand what the official narrative was. That is, that which is generated by a particular government or particular leadership. Uh, so I chose to look only at manifestations of an official narrative. 
But even there, a narrative is multi-stranded and it can be quite complex because it includes not just the state's version of national history, but also a range of values, aspirations, and identity elements. Okay. Now, this, so, a, so a national narrative is, is actually a huge multi-stranded um, uh, construction. In order to focus my work, I looked at three different elements in these different countries that I studied, and today I'm just gonna be looking at one. So the three that I looked at were the founding story or myth, and that's what I'll focus on today in the Egyptian case, this the notion of revolution. But I also looked in the larger study at definitions of national unity, how they changed over time, as well as what the parameters of national identity are or have been changing over time. Now some people in, in uh, similar studies or studies where there are some parallels or overlapped, overlaps are interested in questions of national memory or memory studies. I was less interested in that than in what some people have called the creation of a usable past. That is the construction of a, of a national history that can be mobilized, that can be channeled, that can be used by a leadership for a demand, a need, a crisis in the present. And so as I progressed through my project and as I looked at other work that had been done on national narratives, I was drawn to an approach that focused on crisis um, points, specifically on junctures. It could be the death of a leader. It could be the assassination of a leader. It could be a, a war. It could be an internal insurgency. It could be a major economic crisis. Looking at those as junctures that might trigger a change or restructuring of a narrative. Now, just one final set of, of points before I talk more specifically about where I, where I read this narrative. I said before that narratives can change, that they, that they are evolving uh, constructions, energies. But how is it possible that something which is a national story that people learn over time, how is it that people accept various notions of change? How can you accept a change that's introduced into a, a, a national story? People who've worked on ideology, which underpins national narratives, have argued that a lot of the constituent elements, a lot of the symbols, a lot of the events that are incorporated into a national narrative um, actually have uh, constituent elements that can have different meanings or that are open to different interpretations over time so that you don't have to remove an element in a narrative, you don't have to completely replace it, but you can change the emphasis depending on what the crisis of the day is. So that enables a narrative to maintain its constituent elements, but still have a great deal of flexibility in terms of the kinds of um, messages that it can send, the kind of mobilizing that it may be able to achieve depending on what the crisis of the day is. Okay. All right, then in terms of sources, where does one read this narrative? How, if I'm gonna tell you what the Egyptian narrative was over time, how can I, what were my sources? There are a lot of different places that one can go. Um, there are films, there are folk tales, there are plays, there are, uh, there's poetry, novels, TV, radio uh, series, and so on. But again, it's, what I wanted to focus on specifically was the state narrative, and so in order to do that, I thought the best way to, to the types of materials that I should look at were publications, documents that are produced by the state. So here are the, are the major ones that I looked at in, in my study looking at successive issues of constitutions, particularly preambles, which tend, which often will say something about national history, but even if they don't talk about national history, they'll often give the characteristics of who we are as a people. National charters, which often will define or redefine state society relations. Speeches to the nation by the leader on um, important occasions. Museums, the way museums are constructed, the way that history is portrayed through them images on national currency and stamps, how that evolves over time, the content of patriotic songs, and then school textbooks. So, when I began the project, I was most interested in focusing on the content of school textbooks, because they seemed like an obvious place for reading what any government wants the children, the next generation, to learn, to understand about their history. And in fact, some of you may be familiar with the, the construct or the, the, the phrase that um, Max Weber used to use uh, or used about um, the importance of monopoly of legitimate force as a, a, uh, a characteristic of a sovereign state. Well, Ernest Gellner revised this phrase of Weber's and went so far as to say that the monopoly of legitimate education 
is now more important, more central than the monopoly of legitimate violence to state sovereignty. All right. So when we think about textbooks, there's a bounded set of textbooks. All children in public schools and many children in private schools as well use them, and they're exposed to the same books, the same stories over and over again. So in terms of trying to inculcate a story, values, understandings of, nat of national history, these textbooks are one of the greatest sources that we can, we can look at. So I have some pictures here just of a few of the textbooks that I collected or, or photo actually photocopied as I was doing my research in Egypt. There's a, a civics book, I've got a, an Arabic language textbook, a couple of religious education books, this Islamic education, here's a Coptic education book from Egypt, okay, and a civics book. You can see the quality varies. Uh, some of these are quite old, this is from 1957, so I tried to collect and looked at things from uh, over a long period of time. All right, let me turn then to the Egyptian case and explain to you exactly how I went about doing this and, and, and the importance of uh, a revolution. Now we talk about the founding story in Egypt, we talk about the origins of the Egyptian state. Most people will point to uh, Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali as the founder of the Egyptian state, right? So he becomes, he rules Egypt from 1805 to 1848. He takes control during the period that follows the, the, the disorder that was triggered by the Napoleonic invasion. He's credited with institutionalizing a range of things in Egypt, but in particular the military, um, as well as greater organization of, of the economy. Right. Now, as for the language of revolution or revolt, uh, there are two uh, sort of iconic uh, events in Egyptian history before we get to 1952. Uh, the first, and this is, as, again, if we look at, at portrayals of Egyptian history by Egyptians, this is also the first one, is the Arabi uh, revolt. Uh, this was led by Ahmed Arabi, who was a colonel in the Egyptian army. Um, and this was between 1879 and 1882. It was ultimately defeated, but this is subsequently portrayed as the first example of an anti-colonial nationalist movement in Egypt. Now, some historians obviously will uh, have some quarrels with that, but anyway, that's the way that this is, that is the way that this is portrayed. The next uh, example of revolution, and again, the, the difference in Arabic between revolution and revolt, thawra, is, tends to be used in both cases, was that of 1919. Uh, again, this is a popular uprising which forced the British to accord nominal independence to Egypt, um, and in the aftermath of which, we then begin to see, for example, in the 1923 constitution, assertions of a national spirit, uh, as well as proclamations of sovereignty, so the beginnings of talking more about national um, elements that feed into a national narrative. In any case, it's, about, it's against the background of the Orabi revolt, the Orabi revolution, and the, the revolution of 1919 that the free officers who overthrew King Farouk in 1952, that they had to define or redefine what the notion of a revolution was. So what were the elements of this revolutionary story that were called upon, that were marshaled as part of this process of overthrowing the king and then trying to establish a new regime? Now, you may know that the, the group of officers that overthrew King Farouk, the free officers, were sort of generic nationalists. There wasn't some strong, uh, extensively articulated uh, ideology. But their uh, declarations did establish the beginnings of a basis of a new founding story for Egypt, the founding story of the 1952 revolution. And these elements were first uh, explained or uh, set out in the, the letter of July of 19, uh, 26 July 1952 that was sent to King Farouk explaining why the officers had done what they had done. So the, ju the justifications for the overthrow of the king, which become part of this narrative, the justification for revolution, or the following, that there was chaos that had become widespread in the country, that the king had disregarded the constitution and the will of the people, uh, that there was an affluent elite and they lived at the expense of a poor and starving population. There was the loss uh, in the Palestine War of 1948 and the king's role in the scandal of the faulty weaponry you may be familiar with. Okay? Now, over the next several months, there were other major declarations that were issued by the, the free officers that further fleshed out this, the reasoning behind the, uh, there this emerging founding narrative of the revolution. Uh, they continued to focus on elements of decay and corruption that justified the revolution. But then there was a second theme that was introduced, which became central to the narrative, which, which was the ensuring of the bases for a dignified life. All right, so it wasn't just removing the old political order, but it was going to be establishing a new order, a new socio-economic order in its place. 
Now, in the meantime, as you may know, there was a struggle that was going on within the free officers, among the free officers themselves. Ultimately, the winner becomes Gamal Abdel Nasser, so he becomes and becomes president. But during this period of struggle, Nasser himself, or probably Haeckel, um, penning this for him, sets forward his ideas about the revolution. And this then is uh, in the form of the philosophy of the revolution, Falsafat al-Thawra, which laid out um, the basic legitimacy formula for this new regime going forward. And it was clear then there was a commitment to a much broader revolutionary program. So the revolution is no longer simply the overthrow of the king. Right? It's no longer just these, these immediate political steps to get rid of foreign influence. It becomes a much longer term program. So the revolution has a life well beyond just the, the initial uh, removal of the monarchy and the coming to power of the free officers. All right? So this is an ongoing process. And it has two major parts. It has, there's a political revolution that Nasser talks about. Um, in, which involves returning rule to the Egyptians, and a social revolution which, was, which involved class struggle that was ultimately supposed to be stabilized through the achievement of, of social uh, or societal justice. Right? Now part of the process of um, concretizing or establishing this as part of the narrative going forward uh, was achieved through a reform that was instituted by the Ministry of Education in issuing new textbooks. Right? So we have a whole set of new textbooks that are um, issued in the, in the immediate aftermath, sort of the, the early to mid, uh, mid, late 1950s. So I have a few slides here which underline some of the elements of national identity that are being stressed. So there's a, uh, a Puranic, uh, there's a, a Puranic temple, there is a, a tank, there's a soldier, there's also clearly a mosque. So these are some of the elements that are clearly part of the narrative going forward. But here we have some contrasts between, so there's the old order and then there's the new order. So after we were ruled by foreign, after our country was ruled by foreigners, now today we've become free in our homeland. Okay? So after we were slaves to a foreign and corrupt ruler, uh, today we've become um, I mean, our, our rulers are, are from us. They're from, from our, our own homeland, right? Um, and I'm having troubles. I can't see the Arabic. Group. So after our, our leaders basically ignored the, the concerns of the peasants and the workers, uh, today, you know, land has been distributed. And Mudurit um, Tahrir, which was the area of reclaimed land, was, uh, was, uh, was established. Okay, so others, after we were divided among ourselves, uh, now our, our, our ranks have been solidified and, and, and strengthened. Okay. Um, anyway, so these are just other examples of the, these contrasts. So you see the difference of the, the old order and then the, the revolutionary order, which has to do with political change, but also has to do with, uh, with uh, social justice. Okay. Now, in the period that follows this, of course, there were a number of important foreign policy challenges. Uh, and I'll just go through them um, briefly and explain what, how they relate then to this emerging uh, or this uh, evolving narrative of, of revolution. There was the nationalization of the Suez Canal Company, uh, which was intended to give Egypt the resources it needed to build the, the Aswan Dam. But that was followed shortly thereafter by this tripartite uh, invasion by Israeli, British, and French forces, which was a military defeat for Egypt, but which then becomes a political victory. And the revolutionary regime then is able to add this as a new element to its legitimizing formula. So it, it, it calls on an, an earlier period of struggle, um, and it asserts this then as a new stage in Egypt's ability to withstand foreign invaders and to reassert its, its sovereignty. A next chapter in this evolution of the narrative comes in 1961 with the breakup of the United Arab Republic. So this Syria uh, secedes. Uh, this is a huge blow to Nasser. So you would wonder how would then this regime respond to the, the breakup of what had to that at that point been sort of the culmination of this drive for greater Arab unity. Well, part of what had driven the Syrian secession were a series of uh, economic uh, declarations or economic um, uh, policies intended to assert greater state control over the economy. 
Uh, so in the wake of the secession, Nasser then begins to talk about this new set of economic policies as part of a socialist revolution. So we're now moving beyond what the early part of the revolution was into a new stage. So he, he uses what had been a setback uh, of the secession of Syria and instead, instead tries to say we're now moving into a new stage of the revolution. This will be the socialist revolution where the state will take greater control of the economy and he announces this in um, this, a new document called Al Mithaq. Uh, sorry, this is uh, not him announcing the Mithaq. This is announcing a, a constitution, but anyway, it was a good picture of Nasser and the masses. So, uh, in the Mithaq, the term revolution was used to continue to stress the continuity with the previous regime. The traditional narrative of 1952 and all the reasons for the, early, for the revolution were reinforced. And it was simply that Egypt was embarking on a new stage. Right. Now, the next major challenge or crisis comes with 1967. And when I was doing this research, I would have thought prior to, uh, to the investigation of the textbooks and the documents and so on, that a 19, the, the, the crisis of 1967, the, set, the setback, uh, the Nexa, would have uh, been such a shock that there would have been a need to reconstruct a national story. But in fact, that's not what one finds. Uh, it's quite interesting, in fact, that wars, as I look at it more broadly in this book, did not seem to trigger a reconstruction of national narratives. Instead, Nasser linked the crisis of the day to the longstanding themes of past struggle against foreigners, against attempts by outsiders to, uh, to take control of Egypt, to um, uh, and, and to try to undermine the revolutionary process. So the 1967 war did not result in a major restructuring of the narrative. Instead, uh, the, the next major restructuring of the narrative came after Nasser's death and the coming to power of Anwar Sadat, who as you see on the lower uh, right-hand corner, was one of the free officers. So when Sadat came to power, he came as someone who had a certain degree of legitimacy in terms of this ongoing theme of the revolution because he had been one of the free officers uh, who participated in the revolution. And his initial pronouncements all suggested continuity with the previous regime. He even, about five months after uh, Nasser's death, had pictures of Nasser, the size of his own picture, put in all government offices to try and stress this uh, continuity and similarity of goals and so on. However, there were, as you may know, um, groups within this, this ruling clique that were opposed to Sadat uh, and that were plotting ultimately to, to try and push him aside. He outmaneuvered them. He uh, carried out a purge in May of 1971, which, he, which served to help reinforce his power, remove those who were opposed to him, and he called this a corrective movement. So this begins to introduce a new element into what will become a part of the revolutionary story. Um, Sadat takes this 15th of May event when he had purged this oppositional group, and he uses this then as a, an annual occasion for a, a speech. So it, it, historically, since the, the revolution, the 26th of July had been the annual occasion for a major speech. Now the 15th of May will also be one. This is, this is Sadat's first attempt to try and establish a new um, uh, sort of a persona for himself, uh, begin to try and develop his own um, so his, his own part of, or his own version of a narrative. He continued to proclaim the importance, the centrality of all of the previous documents that had been part of this revolutionary definition, the, the Falsafa de Thawra, the Al-Mithaq, and so on. But he begins to introduce a couple of new themes. One is the need for a, um, for the revolution to renew itself, perhaps to correct itself, while careful to maintain its, its, its basic principles. He also begins to introduce a notion of a different kind of legitimacy. He starts talking about how under Nasser, the type of legitimacy that the re regime enjoyed was revolutionary legitimacy, but he's going to move now to fulfill the political goals of the revolution, which he said had not been fulfilled under Nasser. To do that, Egypt needs to move away from the spaces of revolutionary legitimacy to what he called constitutional legitimacy, which is based in what I think in English we would translate as rule of law or daulet muessaset. Right. So he's beginning to introduce some new notions. He's laying the basis for a gradual move away from some of the emphases that were, that were most important under Nasser. But it really takes the 1973 war, 
where, which is, is Sadat's sort of uh, heroic moment, his, the event which enables him to establish a, a new narrative for himself, or at least a new legitimizing event for himself. Um, it, it takes this particular development, this quote unquote victory of 1973, for him to really begin to set out um, a, a new course, all the while maintaining much of the same uh, discourse about, about revolution. So he, emboldened by this victory, uh, he begins to criticize elements of the revolution. Um, he still maintains his, uh, his loyalty to the revolution, but says that there needs to be a, a correction of course, that we need to now complete the revolution. And by 1975, as he's giving his Revolution Day speech, his movement of correction of May 1971 is no longer a movement, it's now a revolution in and of itself. So now we have a corrective revolution of which Sadat um, is, the, is the author. All right. Now, regardless of all of Sadat's attempts to build or reinforce bases of legitimacy and so on, obviously there were many problems in Egypt at the time, not the, not the least of which had to do with his attempt to discredit certain elements of the left, the Nasserists, and appeal to the religious right in Egypt. And uh, thereby, in order to do so, he introduced, and this is a topic for another presentation, he introduced into the narrative a discourse of Islam and morality, which had not been a part of the earlier narrative under, under Nasser. Um, therefore, it was at very least ironic that um, he met his, uh, his end through uh, assassination at the hands of gunmen from the Ex, uh, extreme religious right. We then move on to the next regime. This, the, trans, the, the transition from Sadat to Mubarak, I mean, if one thinks about the way that it took place, this sort of this violent, bloody end, uh, might suggest that this would be a juncture at which there would need to be a significant rewriting of a narrative. But in fact, unlike the case with Nasser to Sadat, which took place peacefully and according to constitutional norms, um, where there was a significant succession struggle, from, Mubarak, from Sadat to Mubarak, there was no real succession struggle. struggle. Mubarak was not of the generation of the free officers, but he did have a military, he had strong military credentials, he had led the Air Force during the 1973 war. Um, he did not face the challenge of stepping into the shoes of a, um, of a beloved predecessor, um, the problem that Sadat had had, because by the time Sadat was assassinated, societal opposition to him had, had grown, quite, grown quite strong. During the Mubarak period, in terms of the narrative of revolution, we don't see much change. Um, the, the major challenges that came to the Mubarak regime were internal ones, the, the low-level Islamic insurgency, if you will, or periodic acts of terrorism, were addressed largely by changes in the narrative which had to do with Egyptian values, trying to reassert that Egypt is a society of tolerance and so on. The general narrative of the revolution continued, um, but at the same time, the economic policies that were being pursued by the Mubarak regime were increasingly gutting whatever content there had been, at least to the social or, and, and economic, the commitment to social and economic justice um, of the uh, 1952 revolution. So for example, by September 2000 under Mubarak, the, the, the political program of the National Democratic Party uh, if one reads the language of it, it sounds like a document that could have been issued by the IMF. I mean, it is all about neoliberal economic reforms. There's nothing left of the, uh, the commitment to social and economic justice that was a part of the program of 1952. So during Mubarak's presidency, he continued to give the annual speech on Revolution Day, but the speeches became shorter. The, the narrative of the reasons behind the revolution also became uh, less and less um, robust, and it was more of a perfunctory performance rather than, than something that demonstrated a real regime commitment to those, um, to those principles. So, one, it, if, if one could imagine Mubarak continuing, one might imagine that the narrative of the revolution for 52 would have continued, but again, to be of less and less importance. Um, his, ultimately, his venality, his corruption led to his, uh, to his overthrow. And we then have a new story of revolution. Uh, and so I want to talk about the, this as a postscript, what's happened since 2011, uh, in just a moment, but let me sum up briefly 
uh, where I've come so far in terms of this, of this larger study and the way that I'm trying to understand the role of narratives. And then I'll speak for just a few minutes uh, about what happened since, since 2011. Uh, all right, so in terms of thinking about critical junctures in Egyptian history, it seems that in looking back over economic crises, in insurgencies, uh, deaths of leaders and so on, the periods that were, that served as the greatest opening or seemed to really spark the greatest uh, need or possibilities for introducing new elements or new interpretations into the, the narrative came during periods of what I call contested successions. So 1952, where you actually have a new regime, a completely new regime, uh, we see a, uh, a completely new story. We have a new founding story, really, for, uh, for modern Egypt. In response to the, the, the coup, if you will, of 1961, the withdrawal, the Syrian secession, um, there, Nasser responded by adding an element of you know, socialism, revolutionary socialism, to, to the narrative. But there wasn't a major change. Um, the disaster of 1967, we didn't see a major change in the narrative. It's not until we come to the succession of Sadat, where Nasser is gone, Sadat comes, and he really is in need of a new, he needs to distinguish himself from his predecessor, and so we begin to see a lot of different elements introduced into the narrative, all the while maintaining this notion of revolution and the, the, the early story of revolution. Okay. Um, so by the time then we move to Mubarak, his, his uh, succeeding Sadat, again, this is, a, this is a succession that takes place peacefully. It's expected. There is no need. Mubarak doesn't feel a need to justify his coming to power. He doesn't have to try and fill the shoes of a larger-than-life predecessor. And so they're really, I, I, I don't call that a contested succession at all. This is a succession which took place uh, relatively um, simply and peacefully. All right. All right, then let me turn as just a sort of a postscript to talk a little bit about what's happened since January of 2011. Um, there are a lot of interesting uh, attempts at trying to change elements of Egyptian history. I won't go into all of those. I'll just focus for a few minutes on the story of revolution itself since, uh, since January of 2011. First of all, the SCAF, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, which comes to power uh, in Egypt after Mubarak relinquishes the presidency, made no attempt to repress uh, the narrative of revolution. In fact, I think you could make the case that it served their interests to have people believe that they had actually made a revolution, but they made it and it was over. You know? So unlike what we see under, with the, the free officers under uh, and Nasser, where you have not only you have this, you have this coup, but then this attempt to, to build the story of an ongoing uh, process of, of societal and political change, the SCAF was interested, I think, in bringing things under control and stabilizing the situation. So they, they didn't want to encourage uh, a narrative of an ongoing revolution. <clears throat> And they, so the SCAF issued a number of statements shortly after coming to, uh, to power in an attempt to try and take control of the narrative. Uh, and I think in no small part as, um, as an attempt to shift the blame for many of the, the violent acts that had taken place during the early days, the early days of the demonstrations, um, to shift the blame for those acts away from the Baltagia, the, 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 the thugs that were a part of the the state, the regime, because of course the military itself was also part of the regime, uh, to shift it to sort of more shadowy third parties or even foreign agents. So there was an attempt uh, to do that and to try and join its narrative, that is the SCAF's narrative, of critiquing those parties with its critique of um, some of its biggest critics who were uh, the revolution, young revolutionaries themselves, some NGOs in Egypt involved in human rights, and, and so on. Okay. Right. A second episode in the way that the, uh, the narrative of revolution uh, evolves comes with the election of the first president uh, after the January 25th revolution, which of course is now called a new revolution. So we have a, we have a new revolution in Egypt. The question is, what role is this revolution going to play vis-a-vis -vis the earlier revolution? Is this going to become a narrative perhaps of a new founding story, of a new regime, a new democratic Egypt going forward? Or is this going to be another episode of revolution which ends up being absorbed by the larger uh, sort of march of what had been a 1952 revolution? Well, it's, it's, it's not at all, I mean, it's somewhat ironic that the first president who's elected 
comes from the Muslim Brotherhood, and of course, as you know, the Muslim Brotherhood leadership had initially rejected participation in the demonstrations that ultimately uh, forced Mubarak from power. So Mursi's early speeches made some references to the revolution, but they also indicated, as one would have expected, a strengthening of the religious content uh, in the official identity narrative. If we look at the speech that he gave when he took the oath of office in Midana Tahrir, remember he took the oath of office first before the Constitutional Court, and then he took the oath of office again in front of the people, the masses in Midana Tahrir. Uh, in that statement in, in the Midan, he made numerous references to the 25 January Revolution. He saluted the martyrs of the 25 January Revolution, and he recognized Midan al Tahrir uh, and other squares in which the revolution had taken place. Um, but then he made some sort of uh, less clear, but, uh, but people understood what the references uh, were about. He talked about sacrifices that had been made in the 1950s and 1960s. This was clearly references to the repression that the Ikhwan had, uh, had suffered at the hands of the Nasser regime in the 1950s and 1960s. So people who were listening to these speeches, the Nasserists in Egypt were unhappy, the military wasn't unha was unhappy because it seemed like a critique of them as well. So you had a recognition of the January 25th revolution, but you had an implicit criticism of the, um, uh, of the, of the legacy of the 1952 revolution. Now, when it came to the first celebration of the anniversary of the, Janu of the July Revolution um, under, under Morsi, so just about a month after he took the, the oath of office, again, the, the signals regarding the narrative of revolution were a bit mixed, um, although he was much more laudatory of the 52 revolution itself. So he turned the 1952 revolution a turning point. Um, he lauded some of its achievements. He ta talked about it as the beginning of Egyptian self-determination, a model for other liberation movements. Uh, but then he went on to say that the revolution's first steps toward democracy had retreated in the previous 30 years. Well, when you talk about a period of 30 years, he was referring specifically, of course, to Mubarak's period in office. So he left out of any critique or any commentary about what had happened to the march of the revolution between 1952 uh, and 1981, and then began his critique with what had happened under Mubarak. So there his, his criticism was very clearly of the previous regime only and not really making any reference to, um, uh, to the Nasser period or the Sadat period. Okay. Um, as Opposition to Morsi grew um, toward the end of 2012, and he arrogated to himself powers that he claimed to be above judicial review, uh, for which he was uh, widely criticized. This is also the period of the pushing through of a new constitution. Um, he, claimed, he announced that he, he announced a new law, which was called the Revolution Protection Law, and he claimed that that new law would then guarantee the rights of the martyrs of the 25th of January, those people who had been injured, uh, that would ensure the retrial of members of the previous regime um, who had been accused of killing protesters. So in a way, he was reaching out and reaffirming the legitimacy of, of this 25 January revolution. But it really fell on deaf ears because those people who had been, those who were his opponents didn't see this as aimed at protecting the revolution at all. They saw it as just another example of what they, they viewed as an, an increasingly authoritarian approach to, to governance. Shortly thereafter, we have the anniversary of the January Revolution. So people were wondering how Morsi would commemorate that. What happened was instead of giving a speech on the 25th of January, he chose instead to give a speech on the 24th of January, which was the uh, Mullah the Nabawi, the, the, the prophet's birthday. Uh, and so his avoidance of giving a speech on the 25th of January at all seemed to be a clear signal of this growing divide, this growing um, opposition between him and those who had been most central to making the revolution. Uh, we then move on into the year uh, as the this Tamarud movement grows, the gathering of signatures, ultimately the demonstrations of 30 June, the military's ouster of Morsi, their disappearing of, of Morsi. And then we have a new episode of contestation over what is a revolution. Uh, because the, for the people who had gone into the streets on the 30th of June, they were calling this a new revolution. This was a revolution which was intended to set right 
the revolution of January 25th, which had gone wrong, according to their interpretation, their version, uh, since, uh, since Morsi had been elected. They claimed that this was popular legitimacy that gave them the right to do this. This was sort of a revival of revolutionary legitimacy. Of course, for the supporters of Morsi, it was the exact opposite. Morsi supporters saw this not as a reinforcement of legitimacy, but in fact an overturning of what they called the legitimacy of the ballot box. Uh, and of course, they then re revert to this not as a revolution of the 30th of June, but in fact the coup of the 30th of June. So if ever there was an example of a contested narrative about what was revolution, what constituted revolution, what didn't, this seemed to be a, a clear example, and it was very much directly related to the struggle over power in Egypt. Now, as time went on, members of the, the old regime, the, the Falul, the, the supporters of Mubarak, began not only calling the 30th of June a new revolution, but beginning to call into question whether the 25th of January had constituted a revolution at all. And in fact, saying that no, in fact, this wasn't a revolution. This was a, a movement which had been inspired by the Ikhwan and various foreign supporters. And in fact, this wasn't a revolution at all. This, was, this had been a, an undermining of, of Egypt. This was, a, this was uh, hatched and carried out by people who had only wished Egypt ill who wished to undermine Egypt. So, the, I mean, if one was watching the Egyptian media at all at the time, you know that these, this very, really ugly narrative of anti-25th of January began to be circulated, but it was, it was also contested. Um, and finally, um, it was announced at the end of last year, I don't know whether this law was actually promulgated or not, I wasn't able to find evidence of it, but um, Egypt, current Egyptian president, Sisi, announced, or it was announced that he was going to issue a law which would criminalize the insulting of either the 25th of January as a, re a revolution or the insulting of the 30th of June as a revolution. So I just, that's sort of my last comment, the last sort of, I think, summary point to say that these, how revolution is defined, who calls what a revolution, uh, what its content or what the, the, the varying content is. These are, again, not issues simply of academic interest, but these are very real battles that are very much a part of ongoing struggles today in Egypt and other parts of the Middle East uh, over the future of the political systems there. So thank you, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you.